Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. One made me cry, and then made me angry, and then made me cry again. The other made me smile, reflect, and nod knowingly. But there, too, there were some misty eyes. The tears and angers were brought forth by the Associated Press's new book, Vietnam, The Real War, and particularly by Pete Hamill's introduction. The smiles are from Pete's The Christmas Kid and Other Brooklyn Story. Pete Hamill, he's a chronicler of New York, a prize-winning, best-selling novelist, a screenwriter, a newspaper man, a storyteller, a member of the tribe, and finally, a Brooklyn guy. Pete, welcome back. Thank you, Doug. Great to be here. The book is devastating. So are your words. I, I, this should be required reading in all high schools and colleges. It's just every page is just, particularly of those of us who were in the time, is just so evocative. Let's go into your experiences there as well. Uh, simply, the, the, I was asked... I was asked by Eric Himmel, an editor at Abrams, who had... The publisher. The publisher, uh, who had published my book about Diego Rivera. Right. Um, and I know him, he's a wonderful editor, but he told me about the project before I got to see the spread of the, of the photographs. The it's unbelievable. I had seen, obviously, some of them. Sure. The Eddie Adams ones are... Famous. Excellent, and we'll be looking at and some of those. And he was a friend, and I knew him, and um, and the one by famous one by Malcolm Brown about the burning monk. We'll show which it. Which put the war took the war off page twenty six and put it on page one. Yeah, I mean, having lived through it, it was it, it, these visual images, and we'll talk about them. Are just they, they're burned into our consciousness. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And the reason was that the AP basically owned the war. Most people could. Most newspapers, even then, when papers were still a pretty powerful force, mm -hmm. couldn't afford to maintain a bureau in in Saigon. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. You need interpreters. You need a dark room. You need. Uh, Living facilities, offices, yeah, yeah. all kinds of stuff. So, uh, like them, I had been, I was there for about five weeks, um, and Eric, when were you there? I was there at the end of '65, early '66. So you're really at the beginning of the build-up. Yeah, up. it's about there were about 180,000. Well, that's Americans. pretty much into it. Yeah, the. the the era of the advisors uh, was over. Yeah, uh, particularly after the Gulf of Tonkin. And, and after the assassination of Jack Kennedy, mm -hmm. Lyndon uh, Johnson, who had very little experience in foreign stuff, None. Um, uh, began to escalate the war, listening to the best and the brightest as they whispered in his ears. Um, and off we went, where it was inevitable then. And, and a war fought by draftees. Right. $95 a month. They're out there. I was 1A. You Please. know. Didn't the, go, but man, you know, it was awful times. Yeah. Yeah. There was a giant lotto going on, you know, involving the lives of young men. Excuse me. I was part of that lotto. I won That's it. I was I mean. number 329. It was horrible. I was in the same room with people whose numbers were 18, they yeah. were going. And 55,000 eventually would, died of the Americans. Right. There were also some Koreans who got killed. Australians. You know, Australians, but also roughly Millions. 3 million yeah. Vietnamese. I know. So you're there. What did, what, what did you sense in the end of 65, 66? What did you see on the ground? Unwinnable. That early? And I am not, 
a military strategist by a long shot. How did shot. you know this? Well, because, how, and how did other people know because it? Because of, of a number of things. They had a press uh, conference every day, which soon had the name the Five O'Clock Follies. Um, and one time I was working with Ward Just of the Washington Post. Right. And we were covering a certain battle, and then Ward and I began to track the battle. There were something like 11 people killed in the battle, and each stop on the chain of command, it doubled. Oh, God. So the reports that we were killing 1,600 dirty communist swine uh, in this battle or that battle turned out to be a lie. Uh, and it reminded me of a great editor I had when I first broke into the newspaper business who said, if you want it to be true, it usually isn't. A good, a good line not only about phone call tips that come into the city room, I, but a life its own self. Sure. And so some of those officers, I don't think, were, were masters of deception or anything. They wanted it to be true. Right. They wanted to believe they were winning, whatever that might mean. And meanwhile, the Viet Cong and later the North Vietnamese uh, main force guys were in spider holes waiting for people to come down the trail and they'd pop up. They weren't sitting in those spider holes debating the Marxist theory of surplus value. They had one slogan. How do we get the foreigners the hell out of right, our country? Right, as they had done to the French. You know, right, and which has happened in every uh, conflict since then. Sure, it's, it's been about that. Right. We wonder why Af Afghans continue to fight. They'd like the foreigners to get out of their country. Right, whether it's the the, the French, the English, no matter who, yeah. Russians, yeah. us. Exactly, and we had no pretensions about starting a colonial empire or anything but we were inheriting the French colonial power. Uh, I tell the story in the introduction of one night in Saigon, going to a restaurant, bar restaurant, uh -huh. music. Edith Piaf is singing on the jukebox. Oh. Uh, and this, one of the songs she's singing is called No Regrets. And way down at the end of the bar, uh, up against the wall, there's three, what I assume were Frenchmen, uh, older, like 40, uh, and two Vietnamese, young Vietnamese women. They started singing, just like the scene in Casablanca. Right. Um, and they end up standing, singing along with Edith Piaf, the two Vietnamese women don't stand and don't sing. Mm. It's not their song. Mm. But they were singing No Regrets, having lost the war in 1954 at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Ooh. It was all over. And here it was 12, 12 years, years later. later. And the sense of that was still alive in the streets. Wow. Um, and, and you knew, it. I'm sorry, go ahead. And, the, and those two women, those two silent women, knew the story, too. It was a Vietnamese story, not a French story. Wow. And you knew some of the reporters and the photojournalists that are they're, they're absolutely evocative photographs of oh, here, yeah. so you uh, knew yeah. them. I mean, there's some real legendary reporters and photojournalists in, in this that People of my generation just grew up with the Peter Arnett's, the David Halberstins, yeah, you know, Malcolm Brown, Malcolm Brown, Foz. yeah, yeah, unbelievable, the unbelievable photograph. Reading your intro, one sentence struck me, and it, and, and let me read it. As a young reporter, I had learned much from the photographers how to see, not merely to look. From Vietnam, photographers taught the world how to see the war. Talk about the difference between looking and seeing and how these photos 
demand that you see rather than, you just can't look at these photographs. You really do have to see them. You have to look at the detail. These yeah. are works of art as well as these, these documents. And that the truth of the situation is in the detail. You know, what you're looking at, and not simply what happened, but how it affected people, sometimes civilians yep. whose lives are wrecked, sometimes uh, young guys who didn't know what they were doing right. there, right. how they can get out of there. They couldn't pick up the, the, their gear and go out and get the Lexington Avenue Express yep. and end up in Brooklyn. Yep. Yep. Um, they were trapped by the geography. Um, so Tim O'Brien, who's a wonderful writer, um, has a book called The Thing About the Vietnam Experience called The Things We Carried. Yep, yep. And so in a way, I'm trying to reaffirm what he say, said, um, that they carried things a lot more than simply their guns and right. ammo and boots and ID cards. Uh, they carried this grief into um, places right now in this country where at 2 a.m. they might wake up and sweat. And then we have another generation, and, and you know, the, yeah. gone through yeah. Iraq and Desert Storm before that and Afghanistan well, and multiple, multiple tours. Go ahead. I'm also, sorry. Doug, one of the things this... Um, book, and again, when I began to look at the photographs again, over and over, what it says is that nobody learns anything. It, we didn't learn from the French. The French might have naively or cynically gone into Vietnam in the first place, we'll never know. Um, but they soon found out after World War II was over, that they were going to have to fight for every inch. Sure. And lost. Sure. Sure. And we didn't learn from that. We didn't learn from that, and, uh, and there's other people who are not learning from what happened to us, and a new generation of Americans not and learning. You, and you look through these pictures, they're all young men. It's yes. like going through Flanders Fields and looking at yes. those cemeteries. Exactly. They're 18, 19, 20 year olds. These are wars. All men sending young men to die. As always. And it's, you know, this ignorance and arrogance that just, uh, don't stop me. The photographs, the photograph that faces your introduction is just one of these photographs where you have this father with a dead child, infant or a toddler, showing the dead child to these, these South Vietnamese and this, they're totally impassive. And it's photographs like this that when you talk about bring it to, the reality, it's not just battles, things with corpses, which is right. just awful. This is, this is real. And, and disguised by phrases like collateral damage. Right. Or, you know, you know, right, right. It's not collateral damage, it's my son. Right. You mentioned earlier the, the images that are sort of seared into our psyches. The first of which, and I remember this, because this really opened Americans' eyes. I'm a kid, I'm 16 or 17, when the monks started self-immolating. And then there's another photograph, let me just go through it, the famous photograph of the, 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 the general holding the pistol to the, uh, and, and blowing his brains out. By Eddie Adams. Oh, Ooh. man. And then I guess the third, maybe the most powerful, is the naked girl running after right. being napalmed. It's right. just these, these are the images. And there's, and there's My literal, Nick Oot. Right, these, these images, there's, there's hundreds of them here. She's still alive, that young girl. Wow. And she lives in Canada and made a life out of her uh, for herself, trying to help other people. Yeah. Wow. Because wow. the photographer, Nick Oot, put his camera down, grabbed her, and drove her to a hospital. Yes, yes, it says it in. And the text here is not, it's not only photos, it's really extremely well-written text that really contextualizes what you're seeing in, in the photographs, the, you know, the murdered prisoners, the battlefields, the terrified children, it's, it's real. When, when you first saw the photographs, 
And then when you first saw the book as a book, what was, what was your reaction? I'd need five years to do this. <laughs> it wasn't something I could write like I was double parked. Um, I couldn't do that. And it didn't take me five years, but it was, um, it was a long task uh, to, to compress it. Uh, what it, what it uh, made me remember, mm -hmm. what some of my friends, including my brother John, uh, who was there also during Tet, uh, what he remembered, what people like that who experienced it uh, remembered. And then people that remembered the specialness of the 60s, that the popular culture, rock and roll, mm. and everything else, merged with what, for lack of a better word, better phrase, the political culture. Mm -hmm. And that there was an enormous uproar in this country, exciting in many ways. Uh, that was and part they, of it, I know. They, they, helped, they helped us save some of us. You know, if it we had allowed so this. Long. That, to happen, but if we had allowed it without a reaction. Oh, sure. And we would have had what, at the very end, once Nixon abolished the draft. Right, right, and, and Vietnam. The anti-war movement yep. began to fizzle. Sure, and go away. sure, sure. It was about somebody else. Well, that's why Charlie Rangel wants to have the draft now. So you Yeah, I agree. That. I, I, mean, I think clearly, if we ever That would put, be a break. Yeah, if we ever put boots on the ground again, the draft automatically should kick in so that everybody fights it or everybody protests it. Ain't gonna happen for that very reason. Yeah. Let's, let's, move, let's move not only continents but hemispheres away from Vietnam and let's go to Brooklyn and The Christmas Kid and other Brooklyn stories. 36 stories, Tales of New York, written in the newspaper. The Daily News wrote literature on its pages. <laughs> I mean, it was an old tradition in newspapers. Um, every one of O. Henry's stories, virtually, mm -hmm. all of them appeared in a Hearst paper first. Um, in Italy, the great Alberto Moravia published oh. short. All of his short stories were published in newspapers. Mm -hmm. In Japan, the great Kafu Nagai. He you got me. Also, also his stories appeared in newspapers. And the reason was that they had a place in a newspaper was that through the medium of fiction, through a short story, um, you can get the guy who's reading the paper when he gets on board the subway train and he finishes the story by the time he gets yep. to work. <laughs> yep. And you remember, like I do, the photographs of people, everybody had a newspaper. Now everybody's got yeah. a piece of electronics, but everybody had a newspaper. Yeah, yeah. And, and those stories, it, it, the Daily News was running fiction, basically kind of pulp serials, cowboy stories mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, until the end of the 40s. But the short story, the urban short story, the moment that reveals a change, a turning point in someone's life yeah. that can express the nostalgia for things permanently lost, Ooh. which is what Keep talking. attacks so many of, of us, because nostalgia is not a fake emotion no. like sentimentality. Yep. Nostalgia is an ache for something that did exist, whether it's the Brooklyn Dodgers oh. or a Spalding. Oh, uh, you, oh you're talking about For some talk. reason, the, the Dodgers have it all, but the G old Giant fans. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Forget it. There's nothing. Nothing. Don't, don't ask no. me why. That's, no. See, that's I, uh, that's yeah, worth uh, a graduate school book. At least a couple of theses. <laughs> no, I mean, clearly. It's, it's this fatalistic acceptance of things lost, nostalgia. And, 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 and the writing here is, 
nostalgia in that best sense. It's really me almost messages from a vanished time because you're writing in the 80s, but a lot of the subject goes back to the Second World War. Yeah. So it's or twice remote and the depression. So it's even, it, it's it's a double time capsule. It's a time capsule of 82, but the, the stories themselves are the world after the war, the days of the Dodgers, and they're all and regular the Joes. Change. And the big change. Yeah, okay, let, let, two, let, let's talk about ones. it. Go ahead. GI Bill. Yep. There's no doubt yep. the greatest big government program ever mm -hmm. was the GI Bill. And successful. Because it, because it created what, when they keep, talk about the middle class, you they're got talking it. about a class that was invented by the GI Bill mm -hmm. that said the son of a Jewish cab driver or an Italian laborer or an Irish factory worker could go to the university. Right. That Spinoza belonged to them, too. Ooh. You know, that they could go do it. And they did. Uh, so that was one. The other huge change, uh, 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 agent of change, was a horror. And that was called heroin. When heroin began mm. to appear in working class neighborhoods, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and the what, world changed. Yep. And and your character uh, Eddie Devlin, uh, just 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 go through a couple of these stories. Give us a taste of it. I mean, Eddie Devlin, you know, revenges the death of his brother. And it's yeah. and it's centered around. Now, what was what was the time like when you wrote it? Was was heroin, as I recall, was the scourge? Yes, because heroin began to drive people out of those neighborhoods. It was not uh, a gang of yuppies who came and, and made all the blue collar people leave. Right. It didn't happen that way. It's ridiculous. One was. Um, one of the biggest changes was uh, the change in factory work mm -hmm. and the commerce of the port. Mm -hmm. A lot of them w lived off the waterfront. Yeah, lived off the, not just simply unloading ships, but, all the but driving the trucks, right. moving them out. Or the to, shop, right. Yeah. So when the port began to die, and you can see right now the port's dead, you go down, if, if, that fellow, if that fellow Sully had landed in the Hudson 10 years ago, he'd have hit a freighter. Right. You know. And <laughs> 30 or 40 there. years ago, the Queen Mary and yeah, all the big exactly. ships. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there were other factors going on, but the final straw for a lot of working class families was heroin. The last thing they wanted was their kids to grow up uh, or get to be 16 or 17 and end up dead in Prospect Park with needle holes in their arms. They didn't want that to happen. And it did happen uh, to too many of them. Uh, oh, by the way, every background, Latinos, uh, right. African-Americans, right. Right. Italian-Americans, right. Irish-Americans, everybody. Uh, and though that, that was the in the 50s, the sense that right before my eyes I was watching the world change. All the great unity that came with the war. One of the, one of the things the war did to neighborhoods like that was prolong the depression till about 1951. Wow, oh, interesting. Because the young guys didn't profit from World War II, they fought it. Mm. And because they fought it, they were starting over when they got home. Mm. And most of them, if they had survived the Battle of the Bulge or Tarawa or something, uh, they weren't going to live in a cold water flat yep. before flights up. Yep. They took the housing, yep. they mar the, uh, benefits from the GI Bill, not the educational ones. Uh, and married the girl I left behind yep. and moved to Levittown or someplace. Yep. Um, whereas the, by the time of the Korean War, uh, which is when I went into service, um, it was beginning to change. When I left for the Navy at 17, I didn't know a single person 
uh, who had gone to a university. Mm. I, by the time I came back, two of my brothers were going. And um, the, the, the others on the street were going to university. Mm -hmm. Told by the older brothers, make sure you don't right. run off and get married. Yep. You know, until... <laughs> right. You you get, yeah, yeah. yeah and, they, and they listen. Yep, they yep, listen. very successful. So that was a huge change. Sure. Just, just to give the viewers a brief overview, the stories are really varied from the lead story about Lev Augstein, somebody from Poland, a, a, a Jew, DP, a DP. the DP, and to two old people who decide that they're going to end it all, yeah. to gangsters, to soldiers who survived D-Day re being reminded about Nicaragua. You know, there's a political undercurrent to some of the writing, but mainly it's about regular Joes living lives in a particular time. Yes. And seeing history repeating itself. Again. You know, without italicizing that. Right. You know, I didn't want to make sure. it too, but sure. I wanted to make sure that the present tense existed. Right. You know, that my boom sock you back to being 17. And right. Also, or, or just the immediacy of the recognition of certain things, whether it's the, you know, Eddie Devlin avenging his brother or the couple committing suicide or the breaking of a strike in, the, in, 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 in the Brooklyn, factory. in the factory, because I mean, they're shipping the jobs to Mexico. Yeah. So you've got, you've and got some... And the ghost is still alive. Right, and the ghost is still alive. So you have this, this present-day stuff, but it, you drag it back. I totally recommend it. It's, it's not really a Christmas book, but it is a Christmas book because it talks about the spirit of the season and of the time. So I, I, I recommend both of these... I love the Vietnam book. The Vietnam book, as I said, should be required reading in high schools and colleges. Thank Don't you. make the same mistakes again. Thank you, Mr. Hamill. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks to Pete Hamill for being on the show and for the pleasure he brings and the joy that he leaves here on CUNY TV. Excellent, Pete. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>